Uh, welcome back to the Spokesman Review Candidate Conversations. Uh, my name is Alina Perry. I'm the education, the K-12 education reporter over here at the Spokesman Review. And today, joining me, I've got David Olson, who is this year a candidate for State Superintendent of Public Instruction. Welcome, David. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, David, um, I just kind of want to jump right in, if you don't mind. Um, the race we've got on ballots is uh, you and the incumbent, Chris Reichdahl. Um, can you just start by telling me a little bit about yourself? Um, make your pitch to Spokane voters, why you think you are the better of the two. Why do you think you should be um, in charge of, of overseeing public instruction in the state? Well, a um, little about me, just real quick. Uh, I went into military right out of high school, went to Navy, uh, was trained to be an electrician, did that for a couple years, and uh, uh, saw some guys walking around in shorts and tan, and I'm like, what are you guys doing? And they said, we're Navy divers. I said, oh, cool. So I became a Navy diver, hard hat diver, underwater welder. So I did that for a while. Got to live in Korea and Guam and Italy and Puerto Rico and, uh, you know, got to see the world, which was really cool. Uh, my wife and kids and I got to travel the world and see some really good school districts and or good school systems and some not so good. My wife was a school teacher for many years. My younger son's a teacher. My sister's a college professor. My sister-in-law is a teacher. My stepmother's a teacher. So lots of education in my family. And uh, uh, we settled after I retired from the Navy over in Gig Harbor, which is the Peninsula School District. And uh, I was a sports parent. I was very involved in my kids' education. And uh, so I, after they graduated, I decided, you know, some of the things I'd seen as a parent in the district, you know, maybe I should start paying more attention and start going to school board meetings. So I did. And then I decided to run for school board. Uh, that was 2013. I got elected. And so I'm now in my 11th, finishing up my 11th year on the school board. I was also elected to uh, be a county commissioner in 2015. So I've done that. And uh, But in my years on the school board, I've seen uh, Washington State Public Schools academically going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So eight years ago, when the current superintendent, Chris Reichdahl, took over, we were number eight in the nation academically with our public schools. And today we're number 27. And I just finally said, as a school board member and seeing the great things we're doing where I'm at compared to the statewide where we're not going in the right direction, you know, that's old adage of like you can either complain or step up and do something. I decided that I'm going to step up and do something. So hopefully in November, the voters will choose me over Chris Reichdahl. In the primary, he got 39% of the vote. That means 61% of the voters in Washington State voted against the incumbent. That's pretty uh, telling indictment of his leadership skills. And uh, so my school district's doing great things, and I felt... If I can do it there, and with my military leadership experience, I felt that uh, I could just scale it up and do the same thing statewide so that all the kids across the state get the same benefit from what we're doing in my school district. Yeah, okay, excellent. Um, another uh, kind of general question. Um, as a state superintendent, you're in charge of overseeing public instruction, you know, public schools. I think there's like 200 and some school districts. 295. Great. Okay. 295 school districts. Yeah. Uh, almost, I think it's 1.1 million kids enrolled or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. yeah. So it's a lot, a lot of uh, stuff you got to right. manage. Um, can you speak generally about what you see the role of public education? What What is public education's role in our society today? Um, and what can you do, you know, if you're elected as the superintendent to make sure that it fulfills this role? Yeah, well, I think one of the roles of, of OSPI, Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, is we need to be a partner mm -hmm. with our school districts, not a bully. Mm -hmm. um, as an 11-year school board member and, and being a member of WASDA, the annual, the uh, big group of all the school board members in the state, you know, I see that how... The current superintendent bullies school districts and school boards, pushing policies into the classroom that overwhelm teachers, uh, not working collaboratively with school boards and school districts, saying, I want you to do this and this and this. And if we push back, he threatens us to take our state funding away from us. Mm -hmm. So that's a bully pulpit, the wrong kind of bully. I prefer to see him bully the state legislature to get more funding for our schools, which they aren't doing. But I think the, the 
superintendent of public instruction needs to be a support network of our schools, not a dictator of them. And I don't mean that in the true sense of what a dictator is, but instead of dictating what they need to do and then threatening them if they don't do it, collaborate with school districts. And I don't see that being done enough, either with school superintendents, school CFOs, or with school boards. I would like to see more of a partnership with school districts um, than the the way he's doing it right now. Um, because across the state, when I talk to teachers, they say they're absolutely overwhelmed. Student discipline is an issue. They don't have enough classroom support from paraeducators, and that's because they don't get enough state funding to fund special ed and paraeducators. And uh, cell phones are really uh, something. So student mental health is really important. I think we need to focus on that. But a lot of the, the groups, the marginalized groups in our state, high poverty, students of color, especially black, Latino, and Native American students, and students with disability are not being served well by this superintendent. And I was telling someone this morning that, in my opinion, the current superintendent is committing executive malpractice, that he is more performative, meaning that he's looking to look good in paper and media versus making sure that we're actually getting better as a school system. And I'm more of a doer and he's more of a talker. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you, can you give me some examples of, or an example of, of how you might see yourself as superintendent um, collaborating with or partnering with local school sure. districts? And, sure. and so yeah. a, a great example is we were talking about in our debate earlier today, uh, the, the Marysville school district is in binding conditions and they've been, they've been taken over by the state. And during COVID, they had a double levy failure. Mm. And in my opinion, when school districts are struggling financially, the superintendent and OSPI need to provide leadership to those school districts and say, how can I help you? What can we do to help you do better? How can we help you uh, work with the community to rebuild the trust so they'll help you pass future levies? A levy helps pay operationally for the things that the state doesn't fund. Like today, I mentioned that the state funds one uh, psychologist for my entire school district, but we hired 13. Those 13, the extra, come from our levy. Mm -hmm. So that puts a strain on the local community. And if there's not trust, um, they won't fund the levy. And then that puts a big burden. So in this case, also in 2022, the Department of Education, uh, the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education, did a preliminary sur survey of ESSER funds that came to the state of Washington to OSPI. And the state got about $3 billion. And two years into COVID, OSPI had not spent almost $2 billion of it. Um, so myself and my former opponent, Reed Sars, have been critical of Chris Reichdahl, as has been the Seattle Times in the past, that he mismanaged billions of dollars. And those schools needed the money. They were expecting the money. And a lot of them spent the money anticipating they were going to get it and then when they didn't they were left holding the uh the mortgage if you will and they couldn't they couldn't afford to pay it back so i think the the superintendent needs to be i will as superintendent work with those school districts to be more supportive and say how can i help another thing that is causing a lot of these financial situations in our state is school board members run mostly for altruistic reasons you, for instance, could decide I want to run for school board, okay? Elena runs for school board, okay? But you don't know anything about a public finance budget, okay? Now, all of a sudden, you're making decisions that could impact hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't get any training. Now, the state mandates that newly elected school board members have to take uh, bias training and all these uh, social justice kind of training, which is all fine and good, but they don't require them, which I will to take public finance training. And oftentimes, the budget is buried in the consent agenda, and the school board member just, do we approve the consent agenda? Yeah. But they never get briefed on the budget. Mm -hmm. In my school district, we put our entire budget online, so every member of the community can go to our website, see every line item on our budget, 100% transparent. And that's why we pass our levies and bonds, because our community trusts us. But we also, every month, our CFO comes to our school board meeting and briefs us on our budget. Mm -hmm. It's in. It's a very cool uh, program called Forecast Five, and when she puts it up there, there's charts and bar graphs, 
and like speedometers, and she can explain it in layman's terms so even members of the community that are in the audience can understand our budget. So I would like to see our CFOs make sure they are trained in budget, but also school board members need to know, don't just rubber stamp the budget. Make sure you know what you're approving because Moses Lake laid off 100 school teachers without notice, and it was because of an accounting error that the that they overlooked, just a basic accounting error that had their, their board known a little bit more about how to understand a public finance document. Maybe they'd have caught it earlier and not had to lay off 100 teachers. So I'd like to do more to help prepare our school districts for that. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Now, another kind of general question before mm-hmm. we jump right into the policy stuff. Um, say you're elected. Imagine, if you don't mind, you're elected. Uh, November, big celebration. Um, January comes, you're put into office, uh, you sit down at the desk. Uh, what does that first year look like for you? What do you What do you hope to do? What do you hope to have accomplished in that first year in office? You know, you're a newcomer, obviously. You've uh, You've never worked at state office before. Um, what do you What do you imagine that looking like? Well, first, I think it would be very exciting. I'd be very humbled that the uh, voters put me into this uh, very important position. Mm-hmm. I think it's time for change. Um, you know, my opponent recently told Mike McClanahan on TVW the impact that uh, David Olson's military background uh, doesn't, uh, you know, overarch into being able to lead this this uh, OSPI. I would say, based on his eight years of performance as an executive, my executive experience in the military is exactly what this state needs because he's a reactive leader and I'm a proactive leader. And one of the things I would say first is. I'm here to help, okay? So I would reach out to all the school districts first and say, I want to partner with you. Tell me how I can help. I would want to set new expectations to say, here's, I want to, I want to improve academic rigor. I want to make sure that, because schools across the state are, some are eliminating highly capable programs. He talks about them, but not all schools have them. Some schools want to get rid of AP. I want to maintain academic rigor for high-performing students, but I want to do more to support the struggling students and make sure that they don't get overlooked. Under Chris Reichdahl's reactive leadership, he'll, he'll make some kind of a policy, push it out, and then three years later look back and go, how'd that work out for you? And oftentimes not well. But the superintendents and the CFOs and the school boards across the state I talk to say that they would like to know in advance what they're doing Mm -hmm. to say, how will this impact you? So I'm the kind of leader that just doesn't throw something against a dartboard, hoping it'll work. You know, like our cell phone policy, we partnered, we collaborated with teachers, students, and the parents to get a policy that worked. So if we're going to try some new thing for public schools, I'd want to have like a summit and talk to superintendents, CFOs, and board members to say, how does this look to you? How do you think this will impact your school district? Some districts have a lot more opportunity to pass their levies and bonds than others, so maybe it won't have an impact on them. But unfunded mandates is a dreaded word for school boards and school districts, especially in rural and high-poverty school districts. So if OSPI in the state pushes an unfunded mandate down, say you will do this, they don't fund it. They just say you need to do this, and here's when you need to do it by. And some school districts are really... Um, overwhelmed by those unfunded mandates. So I think uh, CFOs I talk to especially say that doing a three-year reach back to try and fix a problem versus collaborating with them in advance is not the right way, and that's how OSPI is today under Chris Reichdahl. Under David Olson, I'll be a proactive leader, and so I would disagree with him. I think my executive military background um, there's two things in, in the military. You have strategic leadership and tactical, mm-hmm. okay? So you create a strategic plan, which my district did three years ago when I was board president. But once you create the strategic plan, now you have to execute it. And that's a tactical piece, okay? In war, the first bullet's fired, all your plans go to hell, okay? You go, oh, crap, we got bullets coming our way. Now what? Mm-hmm. Okay? So that's the key is if you're going to be strategic and here's what your vision is, you have to be able to execute it. And my school district has done that extremely well. And I think that I can do that at the state level and make and 
dramatically improve our academic performance, which has been struggling under the current superintendent. Okay. Um, yeah. And before we move on to kind of policy <laughs> stuff, um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned unfunded mandates, and that's something I've heard a lot from our local school board members, mm-hmm. too, is that's kind of the boogeyman, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, is that like something you're uh, intending to, as superintendent, you would never do unfunded mandates or you would um, reduce them? What, what's your, I guess, position on, on that? Well, I, one of the things that, you know, Chris Reichdahl, again, I like to say he's a, a talker and I'm a doer. Mm-hmm. He says, my budget, my budget, my budget. But that always falls on deaf ears. And the CFOs I talk to say when they hear him say, I sent the governor a budget, they all laugh because that they know that his budget's never going to fly because the governor always has to submit a budget, but the state legislature does their own budget, sends it to the governor. But uh, unfunded mandates definitely are not popular because they're not paid for. Mm -hmm. So the state already doesn't fully fund education, um, especially special ed. And so when I talk to superintendents across the state, they say the top two things, and you might've heard me say this at debate this morning, the top two things, especially like Seattle Public Schools, they have a $115 million deficit, and $90 million of that is special ed funding, okay? And the rest is transportation, mostly. So if the state would meet its constitutional duty under Article 9, which says they will fully fund special ed, that's their preeminent duty from our state constitution is public ed. They don't meet that obligation. So what I would like to do is use my bully pulpit that Chris Reichdahl does not do and go to the state legislature and say, we need the money, we need it now, or I'm going to go to the state Supreme Court and have them hold you in contempt again. Because that worked last time. We need to do something bold like that. Because if we're going to ask the schools to do something that's going to cost them money, we need to pay for it. The state needs to pay for it. And they have the money. They just choose not to give it to public ed. And in 2019, the state spent 52% of its budget on education. Today, they're spending 43, 9% less on av- of a percentage of their budget than they did just five years ago. We're still spending more on education than we did five years ago, but as a percent of the budget, it's down by almost 10%. Yeah, um, and that actually transitions really nicely into the next thing I was hoping okay. to ask, uh, which is uh, funding, of course. Yeah. Um, how would you, um, I know you mentioned the bully pulpit, but how would you get um, more money funded into schools? Because that's something, you know, we always hear from schools is, is we need more money. Um, how are you going to make that happen? We're just going to all fly to Vegas, put it all on <laughs> put it all, put it all in red, put it all in red. Okay, so look. Uh, about 20 years ago, maybe 20, 25 years ago, the state come up with this brilliant idea. They had the lottery. Okay, they said all the revenue from the lottery, the, the money, will go to education. Well, that was a joke. Didn't happen. They moved it to all their pet projects. Uh, 2012. What happened in 2012? 421. Mm, marijuana. Marijuana. Okay? <laughs> Mar- marijuana. Uh, Passed, right? And the state, once again, said all the taxes we get from marijuana, which are hefty, by the way, is going to go to public ed. Uh, didn't. Okay. So the state comes up with these great, grandiose ideas of how to fund education because they don't want to use their state budget to do it. So they want to, like, go out and do all these trick plays, um, again, sort of performative. And now they're like, right, I brought it up this morning. My opponent doesn't support capital gains tax. Well, the, my comment on that is the state has not set a precedent for keeping their word on lottery money going to education. They didn't keep their word on marijuana money going to education. Who's to say they're going to keep their word that the capital gains taxes are also going to go to state education? I'd like to sort of see them put the proof in the pudding first mm-hmm. because a capital gains tax and the Association of Washington Businesses, the group that I debated at today, their, their position on the capital gains tax is actually they're opposed to it mm-hmm. because, it, excuse me, it'll make it harder to recruit key executives to come into the state to lead these big companies because they make a lot of money, okay? So that could, that could make it more difficult to bring in these key top executives if they're then going to have to turn around and pay capital gains if they sell their house or sell their stocks or whatever. Um, I don't want to 
prevent great industry leaders from coming to this state. Because one of the things I want to do as superintendent is partner with industry to make sure that when we do our CTE programs, our skilled trades, that we're working with our local businesses to make sure that, you know, yeah, we might want to teach a kid how to build something, be a, to build a house. But what if they want to be, what if we're an ag country, right? How about we work with the industry and that community? What kind of kids do you want us to turn out to stay in your local community and work for you? So we need to be collaborative with industry uh, on that. So, okay. Yeah. But as far as raising the state this year has a 15 billion with a B surplus in money. Mm -hmm. They have the money to fund public ed. They're just choosing not to do it. So the state just needs to step up. The citizens of this state need to step up and vote for me because I will demand that the state fully fund education. Gotcha. Okay. Um, another big thing that um, I, you've mentioned, I think, already today, at least at the debate, um, academic achievement. Yep. Um, that's that's a big one. I mean, it's school, right? Academics yep. is, is present there. Um, could you elaborate on a little bit about um, what you would do to enhance academic achievement and I guess where where your areas of emphasis would be in in improving academics in schools. Well, the, the school districts that are suffering the most right now are rural school districts mm -hmm. and uh, school districts that are high poverty. Okay, so the state you might have heard this uh, during former debates or throughout talking to state reps. Um, they're currently under the funding model right now. Excuse me, most of the money goes to zip codes. So if you're in a high net worth zip code like Issaquah, Bellevue, Seattle, they're going to get a lot more money per student than, say, Mabton or Grandview, some of these smaller school districts. So those school districts have trouble passing levies and bonds because their cap, their property taxes will go up much higher than a, a, a Issaquah or Bellevue where you have Microsoft and, and Amazon and really, really lots of Fortune 500 companies. So they could pass a $500 million levy and their taxes might go up one cent per thousand. But in some rural school district, they couldn't even pass a $50 million levy without their property taxes going up several dollars per thousand. So that's why they have more trouble uh, passing them. But where we really need to put an emphasis is on uh, schools that have a high uh, uh, population of students of color mm -hmm. and students with disability. And specifically, black students, Latino, and Native American are falling through the cracks. And so they also have a higher absentee rate. So if we're not providing good education to those students, also struggling school districts, high poverty school districts, tend to get um, new teachers mm -hmm. because the experienced teachers say, this is a lot of work, so I'm going to go somewhere else and get more money, and the new teachers end up in those struggling school districts and that often creates a high turnover so it's hard for students to develop a relationship with a teacher so i'd like to see us incentivize experienced teachers to work in those school districts there's a movie out a number of years ago with samuel jackson he was a principal of a school he came in and turned it around but it was a tough love kind of thing we need to get teachers that want to go in and help these struggling students give them an incentive to do it maybe a two-year contract and help them go in and lift up those struggling students. I don't want to take away highly capable AP um, academic rigorous classes for high achieving students. I want to work on focusing on lifting up struggling students. When I was in central Washington a couple months ago meeting with Latino communities, I said, what do you need from our schools, uh, superintendent? And they said, our schools need better communication. Mm -hmm. And that's not communicating to the parent so much but that there's not enough teachers in these in these high latino communities or dual language communities that they don't have enough teachers that speak spanish or dual languages so what they end up having to do is push high amounts of students into those classes so instead of a teacher that speaks english having a class maybe with 25 students the spanish speaking teacher might have one with 35 so they're overwhelmed so what I'd like to do in that case is incentivize dual language teachers to go to a school that has a higher uh, majority of those teachers. So in this case, let's say Grandview, 
high Latino population. They don't have as many teachers that speak Spanish as they like. Mm -hmm. And so how about we incentivize Spanish teachers to go to Grandview or, I like this better, people that already live there and know their community, let's incentivize them to learn Spanish, pay for their Spanish classes, and give them a, a little pay raise for becoming a dual language teacher. So instead of bringing in someone new to the community, how about we keep someone that's already there and incentivize them to learn that second language so they can build better relationships with our students. But we need to put more resources into high poverty uh, school districts, students with a high percentage of students of color and school districts with a high, pover uh, high uh, uh, students of disability. Gotcha, okay. Yeah. Um, now our clock is kind of ticking. Oh, uh, we've got okay. about five minutes here. Oh, this, wow, okay. I know, right? Time flies. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about school. Um, I wanted to talk. This this is a brand new to me concept, okay. um, and it came up at the debate, and um, that yeah, it's it's new to me. Um, so it's it's this concept of the state superintendent being appointed by the governor rather mm -hmm. than uh, being uh, elected as it is now. Obviously, yeah. that's why yeah. you're here. Uh, both governors, both candidates for governor, excuse me, uh, said they support the appointment, you know, yeah. strategy, um, as has Reichdahl. You don't, or no. that seems to be my impression. Right. Okay, yeah, so tell us why. Superintendent Reichdahl this morning at the debate sort of used his political word salad to not really answer the question, but he is on the record multiple times saying he supports it being appointed. Mm -hmm. um, I do not. And the reason for that, and he also made it, partisan like uh, you know i said look we've had one political party in power here for 40 years and but the superintendent has been able to roll through not always at the same party in power because the voters can change that person out mm -hmm. so let's just say the same political party wins in november that's in now okay but maybe the voters say hey our public schools aren't doing very well okay and we want them to change well if it's an appointed position the governor, let's just say of either party, uh, can say, too bad, I'm keeping my guy in there or my gal in there, whatever, my person in there. Okay, let's just want to be, cover all my, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So Reichdahl's on record saying he supports it being appointed. Today he goes, oh, it'll probably never happen. We need two-thirds majority vote. Needs to go to vote of the people, yada, yada, yada. But he gave a non-answer, but he would support it being, but I don't. And here's why. Around the state, uh, teachers are telling me they do not feel supported by Chris Reichdahl. They have not, he has not listened to their, their pleas about student discipline, that he's pushing more and more onerous policies and regulations in the classroom that takes their time away from teaching the students, forcing them onto digital devices, which parents say they do not like, okay? And the uh, cell phone policies he has not been, he has not been proactive on until recently, because I'm getting the love on that, right? But if the teachers don't like the support they're getting from OSPI, which are telling me that they don't, superintendents around the state are telling me they don't feel supported by me either, and parents don't feel their kids are getting a quality education based on the fact where we were five years ago, eight years ago to today, the voters, the parents, the teachers should be able to vote that person out if they're not performing well. It's too important, and it's the future of our, of our state because these young kids today will be our future leaders tomorrow. And, you know, Frederick Douglass said, it's easier to build strong kids than to repair broken men, okay? So if we do more to support our students, to make sure they're getting the, the education they need, it'll be much better than sending them out unprepared as they are today, being sent out, needing remedial math and English to go to college, or maybe they drop out of high school altogether, which sets them up for homelessness, drug addiction, or uh, incarceration. We need to do more to prevent us having to future repair broken men and women versus building up our kids now. And so I think the citizens of this state should be able to make the decision of who sits in this office, not a partisan governor. Yeah, okay. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, okay. Okay. Cell phones. Cause you mentioned this again. Yep. Um, that is especially relevant in Spokane. Um, I don't know if you know this, but yep. Spokane public schools, our biggest school district yep. in the County, third biggest in the state, just, uh, have 
did a ban um, mm-hmm. this school year. I've been covering it quite a bit. And yeah, so that's kind of your school district has similarly banned cell phones. A year ago. A year ago. Yeah, yeah. you were ahead of Spokane Public Schools. Yeah. Um, so tell our, me about. So our first candidate forum, coincidentally, was in Spokane mm-hmm. in May at Rich Line High School. Yes. And several members of the Spokane School District School Board were at that candidate forum. Oh, really? Okay. So they got to hear me say all the positive things that are happening in our school district. And I mentioned the book, The Anxious Generation by Jonathan Haidt. Mm -hmm. So anyone listening to this, if you haven't read The Anxious Generation by Jonathan Haidt, read it. Especially if you have little girls in middle school, read that book. But I said that, and it resonated because people, Jonathan Haidt didn't call me to say thanks for my new book sales, (laughs) but I made sure to read it, okay? So not only them, but other school districts are starting to move to do this Mm -hmm. because they're hearing the, the... anecdotal evidence from my school district that mental health is improving. We've got emails from parents saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing this. My kid is so much better. Also, classroom discipline's gone down because the kids aren't on their phone and looking at social media or texting their friends. They're learning. Student engagement, kids are talking to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's funny, when I walk through the high school cl- uh, cafeterias, the kids aren't on their cell phones during lunch. They're actually talking to each other. New concept, right? Yeah. So I say the the number one thing we can do to help student mental health is getting cell phones and social media out of the classroom and start there. Let that go for a year and see how that works as far as student mental health. Then work, you know, let's not spend $300 million of taxpayer money to at some uh, – dartboard throwing something hoping it works why don't we give cell phones not in the classroom and no social media a year to work let's see where we are in a year my guess is that we'll be much better in a year than we are today and then let's do uh, a course direction if we need to but let's not do pie in the sky stuff yeah okay so is that something just to clarify quick before we're wrapping up is that something you would do as as state superintendent is you would like uh res- issue restrictions across the state or you would uh, what would what's your game plan there? So you, you know, as I said, it everyone knows, and Superintendent Reichdahl pointed out today, I'm a big supporter of local control. So mm-hmm. school boards should be able to make that decision. I'm on record saying some school districts want to might might be more rigid in their policy than we are. Some might want to be more lax. But I would say um, Superintendent Reichdahl put out guidance a week and a half ago. Surprisingly, um, again, I think that was performative, not. Because it wasn't a policy, it was guidance, okay? So putting a policy out to say, here's a standardized policy that you can use, make it your own. If you want to make it more rigid, fine. If you want to make it less rigid, fine. But here's a policy that you can adopt for your school district to uh, restrict cell phones and ban social media. So our school district keeps the phones in their backpack on mute. So parents can track their kid if they have one of those trackers. And they could check their phones during lunch to say, hey, I'm going to be late picking you up for your dentist appointment, whatever, right? But no social media, even on their student devices from the school. That way they're not, you know, they don't have their, their screen up on Snapchat, Instagram, or whatever, pretending they're listening to the teacher and they're really online, right? So we block it at the router. Mm-hmm. We want kids singularly focused on education and not stressing on is someone cyberbullying or body shaming them on social media? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think that's time. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for for coming out. Actually, I'm going to give you a sec here at the end uh, just to kind of address anything that you feel like I didn't ask you or maybe um, something I did that you want to circle back to. Just kind of your free time to give us your your closing statement, if you will. Yeah. I would just say, you know, Chris Reichdahl brags about – Our graduation rates are going up. But I said it today, and I've said it before. There are schools in our state that don't give a letter grade below a C. So parents tell me their kids are taking, literally take a test, not answer a single question, they'll get a C. That's called grade inflation. So if we're allowing kids to pass a test when they don't know the core material, they they take a math test and don't answer any questions, we're not really doing those kids a service. So maybe the state assessment that we have right now isn't the best. And I know teachers would like to get rid of the current Smarter Balance assessment, come up with something new. I would agree with doing that. Uh, but teachers are overwhelmed with too many assessments right now. So great inflation is not 
to way to send our kids out in the real world. So yeah, let's. I would prefer to make sure that that high school diploma they get means something when they get out in the real world that they can read, they can write, and they can balance their checkbook. And right now, I don't think that we're doing that well enough. And businesses out there, when they get someone to apply for that job, they don't want to have to send them to read medial classes or just not hire them at all. And so I think we can do better. Yeah, okay. And I will do better. Yeah, yeah. all right. Yeah. Um, well, thanks so much for taking the time today, and, and welcome, welcome to Spokane. I know you're from the west side, so yeah. uh, welcome to eastern Washington. And, um, yeah, thank you for, for coming out. This is you're great. welcome. I love Spokane. It's probably my... 12th time over here in the last six months. Oh, nice. Good. Yeah. Well, come back anytime. You bet. All right. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Mm-hmm.